Assalamu alaikum dear students welcome to the course principle in animal life 1 this is lecture number 46 the topic is cellular respiration and fermentation discussing agenda for the topic is catabolic pathways yield energy by oxidizing organic fuels cellular respiration and fermentation catabolic pathways and production of ATP redox reactions the principle of redox and finally oxidation of organic fuel molecules during cellular respiration lecture outcome after watching and listening this lecture students will know about cellular respiration and fermentation and related concepts introduction catabolic pathways yield energy by oxidizing organic fuels Living cells require transfusion of energy from outside source to perform their many tasks such as assembling polymers, pumping substances across plasma membrane, moving and of course reproduction. So for all those activities living organisms are always in need of energy and that energy comes from the food substances the outside source of energy is food and the energy stored in the organic molecules of food ultimately comes from the sun the sun is the largest source of energy in the universe and the green plants utilize this source of energy for the synthesis of glucose and then glucose is incorporated into other forms of carbohydrates so, so plants are the primary producers of energy and they are the primary producers of food here you can see the green plants the herbs the shrubs uh, they absorb sunlight uh, and in the presence of carbon dioxide water sunlight and chlorophyll they generate organic molecules plus oxygen this organic molecule is later on consumed by primary consumers the primary consumers break down these organic molecules through a series of enzyme catalyzed chemical reactions which are called aerobic cellular respiration and some of the energy is used uh, to run the daily affairs of the body of the animals for example transportation of molecules across plasma membrane and uh, the synthesis of polymers from monomers so all those activities require ATPs uh, and in this way through oxidation of food these organisms derive those ATPs uh, and what those organisms releases that is carbon dioxide and water which are the end products of aerobic cellular respiration and these carbon dioxide and water are a raw material for the plants uh, so it's a perfect cycle going on in the universe and the energy derived by animals 
through aerobic cellular respiration is used to run daily activities of the animals as well as some energy is wasted in the form of heat. The hoary marmot, marmota keligata, obtains energy from its cells by feeding on plants. In the process of cellular respiration, mitochondria in the cells of animals, plants, and other organisms break down organic molecules, generating ATP and waste products that is carbon dioxide, water and heat. Note that energy flows one way but chemicals are recycled. Chemicals that is carbon dioxide and water they are recycled, they are incorporated again into another energy producing pathway. Let's consider how cells harvest the chemical energy stored in organic molecules and use it to generate ATP, the molecule that drives most cellular work. So ATP is the energy currency of the cell. It is responsible for performing the chemical work and the mechanical work and from where the ATPs are synthesized, uh, the energy is already present in organic molecules. This energy is derived uh, through aerobic cellular respiration and other related pathways and this energy is incorporated into ATP and then ATP is used for the performance of various cellular activities. Metabolic pathways that release stored energy by breaking down complex molecules are called catabolic pathways. So catabolic pathways are basically those processes where the breakdown of complex molecules into individual building blocks takes place or the breakdown of complex molecules to simpler molecules takes place. The transfer of electrons from food molecules like glucose to other molecules play a major role in these pathways. Now they are referring to the synthesis of NADH and FADH2 molecules where these two molecules later on convey their electrons to the electron transport chain. In this section we consider these processes which are central to cellular respiration. Organic compounds possess potential energy. This potential energy is stored in the bonds, uh, in the chemical bonds. As a result of the arrangement of electrons in the bonds between their atoms. Uh, compounds that can participate in exergonic reactions can act as fuels. Exergonic reactions are those reactions which liberate energy. So all those compounds uh, which can participate in exergonic reactions are a source of fuels. Through the activity of enzymes, a cell systematically in a series of several stages and enzyme catalyzed steps uh, break down complex organic molecules such as glucose 
that are rich in potential energy to simple waste products that have less energy for example carbon dioxide and water and ATP are produced during the process some of the energy taken out of chemical storage can be used to do work the rest is dissipated as heat so recall from the second law of thermodynamics that energy can neither be created nor destroyed this is the first law of energy first law of thermodynamics which says that energy can neither be created nor destroyed and the second law of thermodynamics says that during every energy transformation some of some of the energy is wasted as heat and that heat energy increases the entropy of the system so all the energy which is stored in the organic molecules is not incorporated into ATPs but some of it is wasted as heat which is unable to perform work one catabolic process is fermentation which is of course respiration in the absence of oxygen so fermentation is a partial degradation of sugar or other organic fuels that occur without the use of oxygen so glycolysis takes place without the need for oxygen in the cytoplasm and the pyruvic acid which is formed at the end of glycolysis is converted into acetyl coenzyme A but this process occurs only when oxygen is present because oxygen act as the final acceptor of electrons in electron transport chain when oxygen is not present then acetyl coenzyme A is not formed then either alcoholic fermentation or lactic acid fermentation takes place and in this way the food molecule is partially oxidized and a very small amount of energy is derived however the most efficient catabolic pathway is aerobic cellular respiration of course in that process all the three stages that is glycolysis Krebs cycle and electron transport chain takes place and from a single molecule of glucose from 30 to 32 ATPs are synthesized but this complete oxidation of glucose and the derivation of maximum energy from glucose requires the presence of mitochondria as well as the presence of oxygen is the final acceptor of electrons the cells of most eukaryotic and many prokaryotic organisms can carry out aerobic respiration that is the organisms which respire aerobically they can carry out this process and remember they have mentioned here prokaryotes so Krebs cycle and electron transport chain can also occur in prokaryotes even they lack mitochondria but they have some of the enzymes which are used in these processes embedded in their cell membrane so in prokaryotes the electron transport chain can take place in the cell membrane some prokaryotes use substances other than oxygen as reactants in a similar process that harvest chemical energy without oxygen the process is called anaerobic respiration 
Now anaerobic respiration, it takes place in the absence of oxygen and uh, oxygen act as the final acceptor of electrons in electron transport chain but sometimes other molecules can also participate in this process for example the sulfate ions can also act as the final acceptor of electrons uh, in electron transport chain but because oxygen is ideally suitable for this job so the energy produced by this process when a molecule other than oxygen act as the final acceptor is considerably low Technically, the term cellular respiration includes both aerobic and anaerobic processes. However, it originated as a synonym for aerobic respiration because of the relationship of that process to organismal respiration in which an animal breathes in oxygen. Thus, cellular respiration is often used to refer to the aerobic process, a practice we follow in most of this chapter. So, in this chapter, where, when, wherever we use the cellular respiration term, it will refer to aerobic cellular respiration. Although very different in mechanism, Aerobic respiration is in principle similar to the combustion of gasoline in an automobile engine. So what happens in an automobile engine? Oxygen is mixed with the fuel and food provides the fuel for respiration and the exhaust is carbon dioxide and water. So, these processes are somewhat similar in a way they operate the combustion of fuel in the engine and the derivation of energy from organic molecules through aerobic cellular respiration. The overall processes can be summarized as follows. Organic food is broken down into carbon dioxide, water and energy in the presence of oxygen. Now carbon dioxide, carbohydrates, fats and proteins from food can all be processed and consumed as fuels. So the carbohydrates are broken down into their individual monomers called glucose which enters into glycolysis. The fats are broken down and glycerol is released. Glycerol can enter into the fifth step of glycolysis in the form of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate whereas proteins are with the help of deamination, the amino group of amino acids is removed uh, and the remaining portion is converted into acetyl coenzyme A which enters into Krebs cycle. So all of them can be used as a source of energy. In animal diets, a major source of carbohydrate is starch. Starch is, of course, the storage polysaccharide of plants. Here we will learn the steps of cellular respiration by tracking the degradation of the sugar molecule, that is, glucose. 
so a glucose molecule inside a living organism is broken down into carbon dioxide and water and energy in the form of ATP is released some of the energy is released is in the form of heat which cannot be used so remember that the six carbon glucose molecule releases all its carbon molecules in the form of carbon dioxide three carbon di two carbon dioxide molecules are produced in Krebs cycle one is produced in the link reaction that is for one pyruvate so for two pyruvates six carbon dioxide molecules are released so all the carbon present in the sugar are liberated as carbon dioxide this breakdown of glucose is exergonic having a free energy change of 686 kilocalories or 2870 kilojoules per mole of glucose decomposed so this is the amount of energy released per mole of glucose decomposed recall that a negative g indicates that the products of the chemical process store less energy than the reactants and that the reaction can happen spontaneously spontaneous reactions are those reactions which does not require the input of energy the reactants have enough energy to react and convert into products uh, and of course the products have a lower energy level because majority of the energy is liberated hence they are exothermic reactions now the ATP molecule which is the energy currency of the cell it is a remarkable molecule it consists of a ribose sugar and three phosphates uh, these three high energy phosphate bonds especially the third phosphate when broken down releases 7.3 kilocalories per mole energy but the ATP molecule stores energy for a very short period of time because the cell is in regular need of energy and this energy is provided by ATP so the ATP is always involved in a cycle where when it is generated it arrives at a site where energy is used uh, and then it is broken down into ADP plus inorganic phosphate and the energy which is released is incorporated into some work so this process occurs continuously to keep working the cell must regenerate its supply of ATP from ADP and inorganic phosphate to understand how cellular respiration accomplishes this let's examine the fundamental chemical processes known as oxidation and reduction so how these processes takes place uh, we will discover in the coming slides redox reactions oxidation and reduction so now in this uh, part of the lecture we will know what are these two processes
how do the catabolic pathways that decompose glucose and other organic fuels yield energy so how the energy is yielded the answer is based on the transfer of electrons during the chemical reactions the relocation of electrons release energy stored in organic molecules and this energy ultimately is used to synthesize ATPs so recall from glycolysis and Krebs cycle that a total of four ATPs are produced through substrate level phosphorylation and along with those four ATPs uh, 10 NADH and 2 FADH2 molecules are also produced these are high energy electron carriers uh, and then these molecules deliver their electrons to the electron transport chain where these electrons are passed in a series of oxidation reduction reactions from one carrier molecule to another and finally they are given to the oxygen atom and in this whole process energy is released uh, which draw electrons into the intermembrane space uh, and as these protons uh, or the hydrogen ions from the intermembrane space return back to the lumen through ATP synthase then energy is produced in the form of ATP so this whole process involves oxidation reduction reactions at several points in many chemical reactions there is a transfer of one or more electrons from one reactant to another these electrons transfer are called oxidation reduction reactions or redox reactions for short in a redox reaction the loss of electrons from one substance is called oxidation and the addition of electrons to another substance is known as reduction so in those reactions uh, one of the substance is oxidized and the other is reduced the one which loses electrons is said to be oxidized and the one which gains electrons is said to be reduced To take a simple non-biological example of oxidation and reduction consider sodium and chlorine which are involved in a chemical reaction and they form the table salt so because chlorine has high electronegativity so one of the electrons is transferred from sodium to chlorine sodium is oxidized chlorine is reduced and NaCl is formed now suppose this is the first atom which is oxidized by losing its electron this is the second atom which is reduced courtesy of gaining the electrons in the general generalized reaction substance X E the electron donor is called the reducing agent it is called it is itself oxidized but it is called the reducing agent because it helped in the reduction of another substance similarly the second substance the Y which accepted an electron is said to be the oxidizing agent because it oxidized X 
because an electron transfer requires both an electron donor and an acceptor oxidation and reduction always go hand in hand so these two reactions will always occur together because whenever there is an a substance which loses its, its electron at the same time there will be another substance which will accept that electron not all redox reactions involve the complete transfer of electrons from one substance to another now here because they have a high difference in electronegativity so the electrons have completely transferred from one atom to another atom but in the coming slides uh, we will study an example when the complete transfer of electrons does not take place now the combustion of methane methane is broken down in the presence of oxygen so methane become oxidized and form carbon dioxide whereas energy is liberated in this process and water is also formed so methane is oxidized and oxygen is reduced the covalent electrons in methane are shared nearly equal between the bonded atoms because carbon and hydrogen have about the same affinity for valence electrons they are about equally electronegative so electronegativity is the ability of an atom to attract a shared pair of electrons towards itself so in the case of methane the electronegativity of both carbon and hydrogen is equal and carbon has four electrons in its valence shell and it require four more electrons to complete its octet rule whereas hydrogen has only one electron hydrogen require one more electron to complete its duplet rule so the four valence electrons of carbon are shared with four hydrogen atoms and in this way carbon completes its duplet rule and hydrogen atoms complete their carbon completes its octet rule and hydrogen atoms complete their duplet and electrons are equally shared because both of them have the same electronegativity values but when methane reacts with oxygen forming carbon dioxide electron end up shared less equally between the carbon atom and its new covalent partner the oxygen now on the other side of the reaction when carbon dioxide is formed of course there is also a sharing of electrons between carbon and oxygen but because oxygen is having much higher electronegativity so the shared pair of electrons spend most of their time revolving around oxygen in effect the carbon atom has partially lost its shared electrons thus methane has been oxidized now here the carbon was sharing electrons with hydrogen equally both had equal values of electronegativity although here the covalent bond is also involved but because of high electronegativity values of oxygen the shared electrons are more closer to oxygen and it is a kind of um, gaining of electrons by oxygen from carbon 
so in a way carbon has lost its electrons which in fact is not the case but considering the high electronegativity values of oxygen you can say that the oxygen has a kind of uh, derived its electrons from carbon now let's examine the fate of the reactant oxygen so now what happens to this oxygen here uh, you can see here carbon dioxide now the shared electron pairs spend most of the time near oxygen here the shared electron pairs are equally attracted by both the atoms uh, and here also the two atoms of oxygen share their electrons equally but after the reaction with methane when each oxygen atom is bonded to two hydrogen atoms in water the electrons of those covalent bonds spend more time near the oxygen so in this case when this oxygen becomes part of water then of course if you compare the electronegativity values of hydrogen and oxygen oxygen is much higher in electronegativity properties than hydrogen so although they are sharing electrons with each other but these electrons will be more closer to oxygen atoms because of having high electronegativity so you can say that oxygen atom has a kind of uh, gained electrons and become reduced because oxygen is so electronegative oxygen is one of the most powerful of all oxidizing agents uh, it gain electrons from its partner and as a result its partner is quite often oxidized and oxygen itself is reduced energy must be added to pull an electron away from an atom just as energy is required to push a ball uphill so this derivation of electrons uh, from an atom also requires energy just like you are pulling a ball uphill requires energy the more electronegative the atom the stronger its pull on electrons the more energy is required to take an electron away from it so an electron loses potential energy when it shifts from a less electronegative atom towards a more electronegative one just as a ball loses potential energy when it rolls downwards so in the electron transport chain there are a series of electron carriers uh, and uh, the electronegativity increases from one carrier to another carrier and the atom with the highest electronegativity is the oxygen which is present at the end of the chain so a redox reaction that moves electrons closer to an oxygen such as burning oxidation of methane therefore releases chemical energy that can be put to work now the oxidation of methane by oxygen is the main combustion reaction that takes place in the burner or gas stove 
The combustion of gasoline in an automobile engine is also a redox reaction. The energy released pushes the piston, but the energy yielding redox process of greatest interest to biologists is respiration, the oxidation of glucose and other molecules in food. So this is of course a process of greater interest for the biologists uh, because it is the ATP which runs all the affairs of the body as far as the energy expenditure is concerned and this is the process where the major chunk of ATPs are produced. So this pathway is central to life. Examine again the summary equation for cellular respiration but this time think of it as a redox process. Now the glucose molecule becomes oxidized because it loses all its six carbon molecules and forms carbon dioxide whereas the oxygen molecule at the end becomes water when it gains electrons as the final acceptor of electrons. So in this case also there is an oxidation and reduction reaction involved and there are also several oxidation reac reduction reactions involved that is in the synthesis of NADH, in the synthesis of FADH2 in the transfer of electrons from one carrier to another in electron transport chain. So there are several redox reactions involved. As in combustion of methane or gasoline, the fuel is oxidized and oxygen is reduced. The electrons lose potential energy along the way and energy is released. In general organic molecules that have an abundance of hydrogen are excellent fuels because their bonds are a source of hilltop electrons. The bonds carry high energy electrons whose energy may be released as these electrons fall down an energy gradient during their transfer to oxygen. So during the electron transport chain several electron carriers are lying in a sequence and as the electron passes from one carrier to another carrier the energy level of the electrons drops uh, and the energy which is liberated is used to force or to push the protons from the inner matrix into the intermembrane space. The summary equation for respiration indicates that hydrogen is transferred from glucose to the oxygen atoms in oxygen. But the most important point not visible in the summary equation is that the energy state of the electrons changes as hydrogen is transferred to oxygen. So as the electrons move in the electron transport chain their energy levels drops. In respiration the oxidation of glucose transfers electrons to a lower energy state liberating energy that becomes available for ATP synthesis. Just as I said that as the electrons passes in the electron transport chain the energy released in this process is used to pump protons into the intermembrane space and as 
the intermembrane space becomes bulkier becomes filled uh, with protons these protons then hold the proton motive force and then they try to enter again into the inner lumen enter again into the matrix uh, and in this search they find the ATP synthase which is the molecular motor and uh, then these protons enter through the molecular motor and in this way the ATP synthase carries out the oxidative phosphorylation process and ATPs are synthesized. So in general we see fuels with multiple carbon hydrogen bonds oxidized into products with multiple carbon oxygen bonds. Here you can see our reactants. Uh, these reactants are at a uh, stable state and they must be transferred to a transition state uh, and only then they will be converted into products. Uh, of course the energy required to carry out a chemical reaction is the activation energy it is the minimum energy required to convert reactants into products. So the reactants must cross this energy barrier and then they will have a lower energy state as compared to reactants. The main energy yielding foods, carbohydrates and fats are reservoirs of electrons associated with hydrogen, often in the form of carbon-hydrogen bonds. So in carbohydrates, uh, uh, primarily glucose, there are six carbon molecules and in fats, uh, there are 16 to 18 carbon molecules. So the fats releases more energy per mole as compared to carbohydrates. Only the barrier of activation energy holds back the flood of electrons to a lower energy state. So these activation energy barrier or this barrier has to be mounted by the reactants and only then they will be converted into products uh, and because of the presence of enzymes uh, this activation energy barrier is lowered. Without this barrier a food substance like glucose would combine almost instantaneously instantaneously with oxygen if we supply the activation energy by igniting glucose it burns in air releasing 686 kilocalories of heat per mole of glucose so all the energy stored in a glucose molecule cannot be derived in a single step because of two reasons. First, the activation energy required for this process is too high and secondly, the energy transformation during every energy transformation, some form of the energy is wasted as heater. So if the energy liberation from glucose takes place at once, then a major chunk of this energy will be wasted as heat uh, and it will not be in usable form. It will not perform any work. Uh, so the best way is that the energy is derived slowly and gradually in a series of steps. Uh, and then this process will be feasible for the cells to accumulate this energy slowly and gradually and there will be minimum chances of wasting energy in the form of heat.
Instead, if you swallow some glucose, enzymes in your cell will lower the barrier of activation energy, allowing the sugar to be oxidized in a series of steps. So this is the end of the lecture. Please refer to the second video for the second part of this lecture. Thank you.